Coming up next, we're going to count down the top 10 songs of this very time frame from the year 1988. We have interviews and stories from the artists as well as your stories and dedications. Then, of course, we're going to recalibrate them based on their all-time performance since then. This is a great show with so many great songs. A couple of artists on here have reached the coveted Billion Views Club. And today's top 10 countdown may be the only one in music history to have the worst song of the 80s go up against arguably the best song of the 80s. See if you agree with me and who wins the battle coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies. Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. Now, if you love classic rock, classic pop, make sure to subscribe below right now to be a part of our community. We'd love to have you. Exclusive stories straight from the legends. And then make sure to check out our exclusive content. Uh, that's on Patreon. That helps us keep this channel going. The link's in, in the description. And uh, we also have cool new merch you can check out as well. You know, as a child of the 80s, born in the 70s, growing up in the 80s, I was raised on Casey Kasem's American Top 40. I talk about this a lot. I listen every week without fail, rooting for my favorite song hit number one, wrote him down on my Trapper Keeper. Today, we honor his memory as we count down the top 10 songs of this same time frame from the year 1988. And then, of course, we recalibrate them based on how many times they've been streamed or watched on YouTube all these years later. We're going to find out what is the real number one hit. We just finished a blockbuster summer with Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Big and Rambo 3. Of course, Crocodile Dundee Part 2 as well. But we're not stupid. Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Big. Stallone. Rambo 3. On TV, LA Law, Cheers, Family Ties still killing it. Then on Cheers, will Norm Fink on a friend to get a promotion? Yeah, yeah, Stone, yeah, yeah. Family fun. And leave it to Family Ties to keep the laughs coming. Oh, no, what are we going to do? Let's get to the music. So here it is. We go back to the same time frame from 1988. Coming in at number 10, there are only a few artists at this point who have had a music video top a billion views. Two are in this top 10. Some artists that have done it so far are The Police, Wham!, Guns N' Roses, Michael Jackson, Aha, uh -huh, and Mr. Rick Astley, who is actually at the 10 slot with uh, It Would Take a Strong, Strong Man. It would take a strong, strong man. It actually went to number one on the AC charts and in Canada. From the stock Aiken Waterman hit machine, this was the third hit uh, from Rick's album, Whenever You Need Someone, after Never Gonna Give You Up and Together Forever. Th both of those went to number one. We're no strangers to love. Together forever and never too far. This song is kind of in the vein of uh, those old soul songs like Ain't Too Proud to Beg. Ain't Too Proud to Beg. Now, I give you fair warning, having brought up Rick Astley, someone is going to get Rick Roll before this thing is over. <laughs> this song has done so-so since its original release. It's had about seven and a half million streams between YouTube and Spotify. Very far from Rick's one billion views for I'm Never Gonna Give You Up, which he hit a few months ago. To ever let you go. At the number nine spot, we have a song that Def Leppard lead singer Joe Elliott said was a play on words. Uh, when somebody chews on your neck, you get a bruise. So in Britain, the word for a hickey, according to Joe Elliott, is love bites. Of course, from their mega album, Hysteria, and their first and only number one hit in the U.S. They should have had plenty more. Guitarist Phil Collins said that uh, everyone in the band was kind of scared of this song because, uh, you know, the vocal parts were so high. We had a lot of people comment on this song. In fact, Sean Smith says that the Hysteria tour was the first concert that uh, he and his wife attended. I guess she was pregnant with her first child at the time. They had a son who now absolutely loves Def Leppard, probably from the concert. Uh, viewer J.A. remembers that his family had a stereo in their lounge room and they all rocked out to this song. Henry Buss remembers hearing the title track to the album One Spring Morning 
and James Cook and a viewer named Marcus, uh, they reminisce about buying Hysteria on cassette with their allowance. I believe one of them was their first ever purchase. Uh, everybody had this album. Now, Love Bites has actually held up really well since its peak. It still sounds great. It's had 52 million streams on Spotify and almost 100 million on YouTube. The sequel to one of the greatest comedies ever was, by all accounts, uh, Turkey. When you don't have Bill Murray, it's not going to go very well. Uh, they did bring back Kenny Loggins for the theme song, Caddyshack 2. You know, he killed it the first time around with I'm All Right. Here's what Kenny said about Nobody's Fool. It was as big a hit as I'm All Right was. It went to number eight, I'm All Right went to number seven. It was definitely better than the movie, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I love- Unfortunately, But yeah. I love that song because at the end, vocally, you do some things that are just like mesmerizing. <laughs> Tell me about writing that song. Is Caddyshack, they wanted to come up with another song? Um, yeah, because it was Caddyshack part two. They asked me if I was interested and I was really hoping that they'd get Rodney Dangerfield and get some of the originals back. And it just wasn't the same. Jackie Mason and- It just uh, wasn't the same. Dan Aykroyd. You can't replace Bill Murray. It looks like I'm a wreck. It's in the hole! I actually had a viewer, a screen named RBS. He shared a story about how back in 1988, he was living at home. He was broke. He had no love, no money, no prospects, no anything. Very depressed. So to cheer himself up, he went out to buy a 45 single. And uh, there was a defect, so he- couldn't play the song, so he went in and got a replacement, and he ended up buying this song, the new Kenny single that was out at the time. Ever since then, for RBS, uh, this song has been his go-to song to motivate him, especially the chorus. Severely underrated, uh, it's only had about three million streams since its peak. It's definitely one to check out in the playlist. Coming in at number seven, we have a group who lost one of its prominent members in Bobby Brown, but they gained a legendary producing and writing duo for this uh, particular song and album, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. This is a song, If It Isn't Love. Jam and Lewis, of course, the amazing duo behind Janet Jackson's biggest hits, Boys to Men, Michael Jackson, so many others. I love this song. It has uh, just a spellbinding vocal from Ralph Tresvant. Uh, here's what Jimmy Jam told me about this song. Ralph was the guy in the studio. He could be in the studio for eight to 10 hours doing all the vocal parts, stacking all the harmonies, doing all the stuff. The guys would eventually come in and do their parts, but they'd just copy what he already did. Yeah, that was straight like Jackson 5. Uh, love you save yeah. type thing. So it was just kind of taking ingredients of a whole lot of different things and making it familiar sounding where you would go, oh, that's a new addition, but also just up updating it, you know? Ironically, this song was held out of the number one spot on the R&B charts by Former member Bobby Brown's Don't Be Cruel. This song has actually soared since its peak. It's had almost 150 million streams between YouTube and Spotify. So coming in at number six, uh, after taking over the world in 1984, this legendary rock band, one of my favorites ever, they lost their lead singer, Enter the Red Rocker, Sammy Agar. After a number one album in 86, Van Halen and Hagar, they had their second straight number one LP with OU812. Now the biggest hit from this record was When It's Love, which would peak in the top five. It's at number six for this week. Here's what Sammy told me about this song. Eddie got married to that song. 
A lot right? of people have been married to that yeah, song. Oh, I know. Yeah, but I mean, that song is like, that's the marriage, the yeah. walk down the aisle of all times. It's so funny. I love it. I was coming down to start writing for that album. I said, what do you guys got, man? What have you been working on? They went in and got sounds, you know, so I come in later. And because uh, I lived in San Francisco, still do, yeah. Bay Area. So he puts a cassette in and plays down, down, down. And I just go, woo, bo wang, oh, man, yeah. to wang, ka wang. By the time we got to the studio, I already had, you know, my co my chorus um, melodies, you know, and even the verse, you know, everybody's looking for yeah. something. And that was the first time I ever sang a line that Eddie was playing. Da, 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 da. Yeah. And uh, I, I just sang right to the p piano. Like doing that, you know, and he's going, No, it's cool, man. It's cool. Yeah. Normally, you you don't sing, you know, like the epitome of that is Iron Man. I am Iron Man. Iron Man. Musicians always think of that as being kind of like a, a dumb stuff, you know, like, right, Oh, right. that's stupid. Don't do that. You right, know, don't right. sing with me. I'm playing that. You play your own yeah, thing. Yeah. You know? But Iron Man was the epitome of making it yeah. heavy, right? No, yeah. no, this is cool this way. harmonies just killer on that song i always loved this song i used to listen to it with my headphones on Dave dreaming about my crush at the time uh, actually our viewer dan hendon tells the story of seeing van halen live in 2004 it was the last time he saw him and he was determined not to miss a second of the show even though he uh needed to use the bathroom throughout the show so i guess he picked up his empty beer cup and he just urinated in it is what he said Van Halen ended the show with one it's love and uh, he got to see it, didn't miss a second of it. Another one of our viewers, uh, screen name Scott O'Caster66, he wanted to dedicate this song to his wife, Sue. They're celebrating 33 years of marriage. Congratulations. Which brings us to the number five position. Uh, this is a diva whose debut album had four top 10 hits. Uh, coming off of the pop scorcher, Tell It To My Heart, and the freestyle dance pop of Prove Your Love. Taylor Dane's third single uh, was a ballad, I'll Always Love You. actually nominated for two Grammys uh, the year after. Here's what Taylor Dane said about the song and the album at the time. This was the game changer for me. Yeah. This put me into the vocal prowess. This, this definitely changed my uh, direction as an artist. And it was very important. And this was a real baby for the label because not only did it start uh, multiply charting on every chart, I mean, it was more than a pop hit. This became a cultural hit. This was a wedding standard. And vocally, it put me in the next level of vocalists. And really, I, that's when I broke out of the yeah. pack as, you know, Taylor Dane, this, this artist, more pop. And I became, you know, an actual respected as an artist. The vocals in that, yeah. This single has gone gold and it's been streamed almost 20 million times since its peak. You're my lucky star. And coming in at number four. We've been Rickrolled. <laughs> Actually, that Rickroll is dedicated to my son, William, who loves Rick Astley. I, I didn't even show him the song or Rick. Uh, he and his friends discovered it on a meme. So anyway, at number four, we have a song that would be the pop culture slogan of the year, Don't Worry, Be Happy, by the very talented Bobby McFerrin. Don't worry. Be happy. I gotta tell you, I hated this song when I was a kid. I mean, I loathed it. It uh, had an otherworldly ability to sit right in the center of your brain for days on end. Still does. This song is known for Bobby McFerrin creating every single sound in the song with his voice. He didn't use any instruments at all. It became the, the first acapella song to top the Billboard charts. Don't worry. 
I remember it had a really cool music video with the late Robin Williams. Uh, since its peak on the charts, uh, it is still riding high. It's almost had a half a billion views and streams, so still out there. Don't bring everybody down like this. And at number three, an artist who was coming off of two blockbuster albums in a row, each with uh, multiple hit songs, plus a number one hit from one of the biggest movies of the entire decade, Back to the Future. Of course, everybody knows Huey Lewis. He followed up his massively successful album, Four, that came out in 86 with Small World. Perfect World came from Small World. That was the big single from it. It was definitely a change in sound and direction musically for Huey Lewis in the news. And he talked about his process that he has with creating new music. Uh, here's what he said. You know, what we're trying to do as a, it's pop music, it's popular music, not jazz. It's right. not classical. This is popular music. So you, you gotta, it's relatable. It's a communication. It's a, it's, it's, you know, it's a message -y kind of a communication thing, popular music. So it's important that it resonate with our, and so what you're trying to do really is reinvent the wheel. I mean, it's exactly what you're trying to do. In a world. I remember I had a theory back then, which uh, became a rumor, a rumor that I started at my school, that uh, the release of Perfect World was proof uh, the Back to the Future 2 was coming out any day, and uh, I just knew it was. Uh, the Perfect World was going to be like the theme song for it. I think I just told myself that to, to get myself through. Uh, you remember that we had the, the to be continued end screen on the original movie Back to the Future. And kids today will never know the patience that we 80s kids had to have to wait so long for the sequel. Took forever, which brings us to the number two spot. Yeah, I know the term uh, underrated and underappreciated even uh, have been beat to death in the time that we live in. But I got to tell you, the man that has the number two hit on the chart dated September 17, 1988, was vastly underappreciated when he was alive. Uh, a venerable hit maker, if there ever was one. Robert Palmer stormed the chart with Simply Irresistible. <laughs> Robert Palmer, he was so smooth. He was like the, the James Bond of, of pop music. The suave voice Brit struck musical gold again with this hit. Uh, this is just a few years after his 1986 blockbuster, Addicted to Love. With Simply Irresistible, he brought back the, the vampy models from the Addicted to Love video. This song is uh, about an enticing woman who gets whatever she wants from her lover. It would uh, be a song that would also earn Palmer his second Grammy Award. It was the following year. This song, uh, it just reminds me of sitting in my room, listening to the radio. It would come on. I remember reading Mad Magazine, drinking Pepsi, uh, which of course was what the song was really about, right? Which brings us to the number one song in the world for September 17th, 1988. It's I remember doing the dance of joy when this song uh, and this band hit number one. I mean, their album had changed my life that summer and... Uh, I would listen every single week, willing it to go to the top of the charts. It absolutely blew up pop music, giving an edge uh, to it that it wouldn't have for another few years. It was really the last time it had any edge in uh, Nirvana. Guns N' Roses with the beautiful ode to one Aaron Everly, Axel's lady and the daughter of the late Phil and Don Everly. lyrics uh, were from a poem that Axel wrote for Aaron. Uh, after dating for four years, they actually got married in Vegas, and the marriage only lasted nine months, but 
Uh, many of you know the story of this song. It's so great. Uh, we've covered it before. You can actually see it in full detail below. I'll link to it. One interesting note about this song since its release. Uh, in 2015, an Australian website called Max TV pointed to its similarity to a song called Unpublished Critics. Uh, that song was actually released in 1981 by a band called Australian Crawl. In 2015, Guns bassist uh, Duff McKagan said that the similarities were very, very uncanny. He added, uh, it is pretty stunning, but we didn't steal it from him. I swear, I never heard the song until a couple of days ago. This song, Sweet Child of Mine, had the most responses from our viewers. In fact, viewer host 7747 said that he was dancing with his girlfriend in college in the 80s. They agreed whatever the last song the DJ played would be their song. And the DJ played Sweet Child of Mine. And even though they are no longer together, he says that whenever the song is played, he thinks of her and just smiles. Great memory there. Viewer Denise Barnard remembers how in late 1987, a friend of hers was doing sound for a new band who was opening for Motley Crue. She actually got invited to the show and she sat in the sound booth and watched that opening band who were named Guns N' Roses. Uh, she watched them just mesmerize the crowd. She never even heard of them at that point. Uh, after the show at the hotel, she actually got to meet the members of GNR. In her words, the Pell lead singer with long red hair, who was very polite, very sweet, asked me what songs uh, did I like? And I said, the Sweet Child song really stood out to me. So many more stories. I mean, Appetite for Destruction, Sweet Child of Mine. This was the song in the, in the album that just changed lives. I'll post more in the comments of what you shared. So after counting down the exact charts from September 17, 1988, here's our new top five based on how they perform since their peak. Uh, at number five, Robert Palmer with Simply Irresistible has 63 million streams. Number four, If It Isn't Love by New Edition, 142 million. At number three, Love Bites by Def Leppard with 147 million. At number two, Don't Worry Be Happy by Bobby McFerrin with 482 million. And at number one, on our hit song Redux, No Change, Guns N' Roses, Sweet Child of Mine at 2.56 billion. I mean, blowing everyone away then and now. One of the biggest songs ever. As Axel so eloquently put it, reminds me of childhood memories. Hey, make sure to leave us a comment about this top 10. Listen to the playlist below. Let's really have a great show here. Share your memories of these songs and, and about the wonderful year of 1988. What are your thoughts on the new top five? What other weeks should we look at here? Uh, when we do a Vintage Years collection concept for 1988, here's 87, which is close. Who should we, uh, who should we include for 88? Uh, if we didn't get your dedication or memory, we will get to it. Share it with us in the comments. We have more to come for sure. Uh, if you like our content, we do invite you to subscribe below uh, to get these albums, uh, to listen to the songs. Click on the playlist below. Make sure to check out our Patreon. Check out our merch. Help us keep the music alive. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. We'll see you tomorrow.